um, I've been playing with this particular model for more than a decade. It, it, it shows up in my marginal notes on an almost daily basis. In, in conversation with these folks for the last uh, few weeks, I, I've come to realize that it's a meta model and uh, the simplicity of it might worry model makers, but meta models tend to be simpler in my experience. And um, this particular one is dealing with a dynamic set of beauty, good, truth, and economy. And it, it actually makes sense of those lesser models. Um, the thing about meta models is in my, in my realization is that they have longer wavelengths and the force they apply is always indirect. And that's unfortunate because people who are, for, who are faced with really pressing problems often want quick solutions um, and they want to apply direct action. And of course that doesn't work. If any of you are parents, uh, just think about how that works out for you. So you'll see in my piece that I use teddy bears, touchstones, and rosaries uh, as a metaphor for this model. And I think uh, on reflection, they're pretty good metaphors because each of those uh, helps us indirectly with the long term. So I hope that after this talk, we, some of us, start focusing on collecting and sharing uh, meta metaphors and meta models. Thanks. Oh, I'm supposed to pass it on. So uh, we, we discussed it before, so you don't think it's nepotism, but Isabella put her hand up first. So Isabella, you're next. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Isabella Pearson and I'm a filmmaker from Washington State. I've been making movies since middle school and they range from narratives, music video, documentary and video essay. I find that art allows me to best interpret and communicate my experiences, and I found the camera to be my favorite way to do this. I love watching and making films that feel like strange, beautiful, and usually dark dreams. Um, the less a film is accessible to my intellect, to my ability to explain it, the more I'll probably like it. Uh, I think I find a lot of beauty in the unknown. Um, to kind of reference the little 10 minute presentation I did. I think I'm mostly standing on beauty the most out of the four categories. I feel like we all have a poetic sense, poetry as an awareness of the world, a particular way of rea relating to re uh, reality. And it's not really a type of intellectual knowing, but more an aesthetic sense, an imagistic sense. And this aesthetic sense can lead one to an ocean of knowing that is within a state of mind where there is great possibility for insight and inner peace. And I feel like it's a place where creation uh, comes from. Um, I've become really interested in watching and making films that kind of seem like they're operating on an unconscious level. I can't really put into words why the film is deeply resonant, but there's something very personal and truthful about it. Um, and I feel like thinking solely in language can be very limiting as language can only hold so much and getting into this kind of state of mind where you're going deeper than mind, where you're sort of intuiting your way through is much more exciting for me. Um, and it's in that space where abstractions are more accessible because it's where you know something, not because you can explain it, but because of how it feels, like how it's resonating. Yeah, I think that's all I'll say for me. <laughs> Who's next? Is it Claire or Kavita? Claire, you can go. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I am an artist, um, textile artist mostly, and I also work as a community artist. And um, and very engaged, always have been in um, what makes communities functional and resilient. And um, so, yeah, what, what I'm particularly interested in is um, what makes things, um, what makes things in our world invisible? And, um, and why is it that some things just have so little value in our society. And I think working in, in the arts, but particularly in um, community art, um, there's very little funding, there's very little valuing um, 
through you know funding through even even just the naming and the acknowledgement of our existence um, is uh, yeah so um, what is it that gives um, something such little value that our social systems would allow the most basic needs to be sidelined ignored or denied um, and uh, yeah it, it it um so i i yeah and what happened to us as humans that allowed us to decouple the intrinsic value of things that would allow us to accept that they would be heaped on the slag heap of what um, chris hedges refers to as um as the sacrifice zones um and i think that has implications for uh you know why we have allowed ourselves to um uh with climate change and um, some of the injustices that we see is we, we just stop being able to actually see. Um, and to me, love allows us to accept and celebrate something or someone for who and what they are. There's no requirement to justify their existence. They're worthy just simply because they are, they've got that. Um, and I think we don't create space in society for that. Um, um, so when we use this lens, it becomes absurd to assign a monetary value or to assess how much power can be leveraged in order to assess value. Um, a sunset is beautiful just because it is. Um, it, it, uh, and um, a tree is valuable because it is but it cleans the air, it cleans the environment, it creates um, a space for critters to live. Um, but in a market-based society, the value we put on it is a stumpage fee, <clears throat> which completely loses the value. And, um, and when, um, when we do that, something really does get lost. And um, yeah, so, um, Yeah, so what, what can we do to reconnect to the intrinsic value of life around us? How do we reconnect to the spiritual domain where we recognize ourselves as part of the interconnected, interdependent web of life? Where do we see ourselves as co-creators and active participants? Um, inseparable and necessary to the health of the whole. Um, I would argue that we need to learn to be more open and present and um, to really see what is right in front of us, uh, uh, however seemingly insignificant might seem. Um, if everything is part of the whole, everything, no matter how small matters. Um, yeah, so I, anyway, that's, that is the lens that, that, that I would bring. And so um, I, I think when we, when we stop observing the, the things that are kind of rendered invisible by a market-based society's way of valuing, we, we miss the real wealth. Um, so anyway, I will stop there and pass to Kavita. Thank you. Hopefully um, my voice is coming across a little bit more clearly than the car alarm that's um, blaring in the background. <laughs> but um, but I, I wanted to say, first of all, yes, my name is Kavita Tana. And um, this week has been an interesting time with my engagement with my name because um, a lot of my friends that I've made during this time of lockdown didn't know that my name actually means poem and what that represents for me as, you know, sort of the way that I try to present myself to the world and, and you know, the way that I engage with others. And a lot of the, a lot of the things that have been said by my co-panelists, I would echo as, you know, sort of the, the importance of the, the value that we place on life and, and um, the, the value of poetry, the value of recognizing beauty, the, the way that we make meaning through modeling, the way that we engage with one another through um, different mediums, you know? And so I think for me, how, how I might introduce myself is that I'm just being me, being the best that I can be of me, um, being free to be me, being, 
you know, really trying to share who I am in my fullest sense of, of that. And, and the way that I try to do that is to create connections with other human beings as living systems in their own, in their own sense of being. And my three top values, if you like, are love and learning and life. And that's really sort of, you know, the three, the three words, if you like, that I hang my hat on, but they mean so much more to me than just words. <laughs> <laughs> they really, they really are the way, the way that I, you know, interact with others, interact with animals, interact with the planet as a whole, and um, and sort of seeing that way that that we perceive the world and the different perspectives that we bring um, from our experiences is really what I'm sort of trying to present in this panel discussion today that you know as individuals let's all accept one another and and try and create that sense of peace in our social systems and that in that thread of acceptance um, not only of one another but in our relationships with one another and the conversations that we can have through that medium of language as as limiting and enabling as it is <laughs> you know, in all its glory so um so that's me so over to you Pele. Uh -huh. So I was thinking about some questions to ask each of you. And I think I'll start with one for Claire. Um, you mentioned that when you're putting art to get work together, there's kind of a risk entailed in putting a piece there. And then you can put it there and you can look. And there's really no consequence to anything but you and the artwork. But in the social system, when we put in a new piece or do a new thing, we find that something happens that we can't as easily undo. And there's a temporality too, because the consequence will have consequences to the consequence to the consequence. So how can you move that concept into the social system? Hmm. Um, well, there's a, there's a, um, there's a paying attention and a being present that is more than just seeing. Um, you know, when you're, you're drawing on things that, um, so this is when I'm creating my art, is uh, um, you're looking at when you add one piece, it, it, it doesn't, um, it changes the proportionality of everything else. And, um, in terms of social systems, um, I think, you know, we don't do enough listening to each other and bringing those that um, uh, are, are the stakeholders in a situation into the room to not only um, have that open space to, to draw out what they have to add to a particular question, um, and uh, so that community engagement process needs to be open and needs to allow for that to, to bubble up. Um, but then uh, following from that, once you've given that input, those people also need to be incorporated into the decision making further up the line um, so that it can't just be, you know, we see this in Black Lives Matter, the, all of the, the people who are the decision makers, if they're all um, Anglo-Saxon white looking people and they're making decisions for people of color, you know, they're going to use a lens that is just not, no matter how much community engagement you've done, they're just not going to bring that back into the system. And I think similarly to an artwork to, to your, um, yeah, in terms of our social systems, how do you balance, how do you bring, I think that that is a, that is a str structural way of bringing that balance into into our social system so well, we should get into round robin soon enough but I'll, I'll put one more question out for now mark you talk about meta level of stepping into meta level and then into meta of a meta what about meta of a meta of a meta and at what point do they collapse? And is there such a place actually as meta anyway? I would conjecture there might be something more to the point of stepping out than there is to where you get to. 
Well, I, I'll just uh, reference how I, I, I never even I never even thought about the concept of meta until I stumbled onto Stafford Beer four or five years ago. And in his uh, illimitable way, he, he, he keeps uh, using terms, uh, assuming that you know what they mean. Uh, he would talk about meta language, meta cognition, meta systems, and, and never really explain them. And I kept thinking that he would explain them and he never did. So I had to go out and do my own work, which is probably what he had in mind anyway. Um, and I've come to uh, really appreciate Meta. And the guy who showed me its power is Edgar Morin. So if you read Edgar Morin, he, he's like an Aikido sensei that um, is able to resolve most of the intractable problems we spend all of our time fretting about, uh, and always by going Meta, not by going uh, into details. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, we'd have to have a longer conversation for me to actually address the, you know, your alternate suggestion. But here's what I think. I think Ashby's law is the most important concept I've run into in 20 or 30 years. Um, surprising with all my reading, Americans don't typically reference it. You got to read the Europeans. But at any rate, um, I think that uh, meta allows you to um, integrate an unbelievable amount of complexity. And to me, that's the biggest problem the world has is getting more and more complex at a rap more rapid rate, rate than any of our models or methods uh, can handle. So this is what I want to say, and then I'm done with this answer. Um, I think this group in our conversations, I think has come to the unanimous conclusion that aesthetics is underweighted and needs to be um, brought forward in a, in a dramatic way. Um, so, but I think there's a problem and that is that when people think about bringing aesthetics into the social system as opposed to their personal life, they become terrified at the infinite variety that walks through the gate <laughs> with aesthetics. And so uh, it's going to require a radical form of courage to allow um, aesthetics into the public discourse uh, because it is infinitely complex. And, and I think it can be done, but it, the other three methods, the other three things, ethics, if you will, the modern terminology, ethics, science, and production, they all necessarily and appropriately narrow the field. Aesthetics does exactly the opposite. And when people are frightened, they always want a more narrow field. It's built into our biology, into our limbic system. So how can we move to love? Because love is openness, and openness allows complexity to thrive. How can we move from fear to love so that we can actually have these, these methods and tools um, that Morin uses to, to resolve our problems? We cannot do it from fear and, 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 and narrowing uh, solutions down prematurely. So that brings up my question really for Isabella, who said that it is important to trust the filmmaker. But I wonder if this is also a matter of trusting oneself so that you can go into this complexity and this trusting a way of opening ourselves to the systemic kind of thinking that isn't caught only in language that enables us to perceive and act more broadly. So it's not a very clear question to you, Isabella, but do you see any connection with that? Yeah, <clears throat> for me, um, that makes me think about how like the filmmaker can create an experience for you to see your own like personal meaning and like insight. Um, and this may be a short answer, but what I think of how that's possible if me making a film, if I'm making a film about my experience with death or love, I feel like if I'm not trying to communicate how I think one's experience with either of those things, you know, should ideally, ideally be, but rather I'm more like communicating my own very subjective and like personal experience with like love or death, I kind of feel like through that authentic you know, reproduction of, of my like own experience. I feel like even though 
the viewer did not have my experience. And even if I'm expressing that to you, they'll never be able to really feel what I felt. I feel like somehow the authenticity of my expression of what I experienced comes through and somehow is able to trigger in a viewer um, their own like personal insights and, and reflections. It creates a certain kind of resonance, I think, when the filmmaker is being very truthful about their own experiences mm -hmm. uh, in their work. Um, and I've always thought about, for myself at least, my art and my films always feel kind of selfish and that I'm not necessarily making them for anybody. I really want to share with people, but it feels very much like a conversation I'm having with myself. So my art being a way for me to explain my own life, you know, to myself or making sense of things. I hope that kind of answers. <laughs> you know, there, you were speaking of trusting yourself as the filmmaker, as the audience trusts themselves in the viewing, or that's just basically the whole thing. And I'm going to turn to another kind of complex pro and not easy answer one for you, Kavita. You speak about meaning. What does meaning mean? What does it mean to create meaning? <laughs> Why is that word so resonant with us and yet so difficult to pin down? And then I'm not Thank asking you. more questions. Thanks. <laughs> it's so funny. I laugh because, you know, that really has become one of the most important words for me in my time with you um, as your student and, and then to become your friend. And, and Isabella talked about it as well. And I think Claire and Mark have both um, referred to this idea of, you know, the experience and, and you know, what, what value do we place on our experiences and is that where we're creating meaning you know that if we dismiss an experience out of hand then you know then no meaning was created whereas if we engage in an experience and either talk about it while we're in it or after the event you know as a as a meta experience in, in an experience or you know sort of talking about it afterwards that's really sort of what meaning means for me it's that i've attached some value to it that i that i you know so for example one of the things that you know i was trying to sort of explain in my introduction is that as a as a living being as a living system you know it's really important for me to feel seen, heard and valued. And for me to offer that experience to people that interact with me. And so, you know, even before, you know, everyone sort of joined us, I think I was the one that was like, oh, there's someone in the room, let me, you know, make them feel valued. Oh, there's someone, you know, and like really sort of engaging with others. Um, because that to me is, is the purpose and the meaning behind um, life really. <laughs> It's that, that connection, you know, what connection can I make with another human being? What connection can I make with other living things um, around me? Um, and in, in our panel sort of pre, you know, pre-discussions, if you like, um, we had a really interesting conversation around how do we choose to converse with one another? And who's more comfortable conversing with themselves? in their own mind, who prefers to converse through, you know, expressions of art. And, and then for me, wanting to converse with other human beings and, and somehow work through that <laughs> enabling constraint of language to, to create meaning. And, um, and that's really sort of where, where I stand with this, this word that is through the experiences and, and what value I place on those experiences. Um, because, I mean, I really want to give a shout out to Claire and, and the impact that her, her artwork had on me the first time that I entered her website and how I was literally in floods of tears and then in the next moment literally laughing and having the most joyful experience. And so immediately she had shared some beauty with me that felt good in the moment that the authenticity or the truth of what she was sharing with me felt so real and it was a production right it's you know something that you produce for the world and so for me it was a holistic experience that I made meaning from and and felt 
so connected with her and I hadn't even met her yet. <laughs> but as soon as, as soon as we were brought into a Zoom room together, I was like, I know this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love this person no matter what. <laughs> no matter how she, how she interacts. Yeah, we'll <laughs> what was that? This is the two-minute warning about breakout sessions. Uh-huh. Thank so we'll you. We'll start to be going. And I think that our being together has modeled the sense of being immediately, in an immediacy of being open and trusting of each other. And that's probably why we want to continue and want to share this more broadly with the rest of you. I think Mark wanted to share something. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Mark. Um. The half hour we've had to discuss in no way um, brings forth the importance that the five of us felt about aesthetics. I want to say that before I actually make it worse. Um, <laughs> Luke Kaufman and Pele both use the term, he's in the notes, uh, Lou, uh, the collapse of meta. And so I definitely want to, at a later date, have a conversation about the collapse of meta because I actually think nested recursions uh, and, and the misunderstanding about how one deals with nested recursions in social systems and political systems is, is the heart of the problem that we have to solve. And it is, it is the case that the communication between meta and meta meta or whatever system and focus and meta is a very tricky business. And, um, and if we don't understand it, um, I'm not, sure we can survive um, as a species. So I, I'd really love to have conversations about the conversation or communication between levels that have longer wavelengths and shorter and have to have some kind of harmonics and have to have some kind of way to understand between two different languages enough. That's it. That's for a later conversation. The beautiful harmonics that come from the resonances that are above the harmonics and create new disharmonics that are resolved in harmonics. It's such a lovely process. Somehow we've got to turn it into politics and, and policy making. <laughs> Sorry, we have to. Me, that, that describes a living system where you have that flow through built into every part of the system. Because it emerges, it emerges from the bottom up. So it, it is necessarily built in. We humans have the hubris to think we can build social systems from the top down. And, and maybe we can, I've not seen it work, but if we can, it's gonna require a more nuanced understanding of the relation between levels than I have, that's for sure. And you know, Lou is a very articulate and smart guy. I'd love to have him in that conversation. And which enabling constraints do we accept and work within so that enable us to do what we do. So it seems, Michael, that's a good spot for us to break out, kind of a natural spot. Seven minutes, there will be a warning at two minutes. Please bring back questions. They need to be retyped into the main chat. Your chat in the breakout rooms does not translate into the main chat. Correct. <clears throat> See you all soon. We are back. Hey, Michael. Hi, Lou. Hi, Tom. Is that Jude? Hey, Jude. Hey. Hi, Tom. You just Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm just meeting too. This is fantastic. Hi, I'm Tom. It's amazing the turnout, Hi, and, uh, the diversity. Hey, Robert. Hi, Robert. Hello. Hey, Mar Andre. So, Lazar, uh, since I can go quickest into what we did before I go into looking at all the what you put into the chat, in our group we got into talking into about how much it is relational to be accept this beauty. If beauty is in the eye of the beholder, are we looking at diff all these different beholders or is it in the relationships amongst the beholders that the sense of beauty arises? So I, the question back to the panel, if you were trying to put it, is there symmetry, a necessary symmetry when you're looking at beauty and something?
Anyone, please. Can you reframe, rephrase that? I don't understand the question yet. Okay. If beauty is to be in the eyes of the beholder, that cuts out the notion that beauty arises in relationship. However, if it is solely in one, then you also are needing it to be present in more than one. So there needs to be some kind of symmetry in the experience. You see that in any way fitting in with how you'd been thinking about it. The symmetry and necessary aspect of the experience of beauty in the immediacy. Uh, no, I'm, I'm probably gonna let others answer. For me, symmetry uh, is an aspect of beauty. And uh, for me, uh, symmetry and asymmetries are, are ontological. They, they, they arise, in fact, they're, I think they're one of the most basic sensations a person has. And then we start attaching names and doing math and other things with it. But for me, uh, I'm always struck by people who aren't uh, aware of symmetries and asymmetries. Um, so to, to, to me, there's no more grounding or profound feeling than symmetry and asymmetry, but I, I don't know how to answer it in the context you've asked. Maybe someone else does. Well, you know, I, I wonder about it being like a, a dance where there is a, a balancing that is not necessarily, um, you know, I think about symmetry as, it, to me, it's more like a balancing and a, and a harmony that you start to recognize um, as being, and, and I also, I think symmetry sometimes, just the words conjure something a little more static, like there is a relationship, but I think of things in a, to me, I, I need to see that dynamic interrelationship, interrelational dance happening. Yeah, I just will add this, extremes of symmetry and asymmetry are signals. They, they make me awake, they make me pay attention. Yeah, yes. I was just gonna offer that, I feel that, are we talking about symmetry or are we talking about reflection? <laughs> oh, yeah. because I feel that we may be talking about reflection and what we see in the eyes of the other and so you know in in that relationship piece of beauty you know what is it that I could see in the art that Claire was presenting to the world that I could feel from the movie that Isabella shared that I see in the visual audio visual experiences that Pile has shared from the um, models that Mark shares um, it's, it's what it reflects back on me. That's the experience where beauty comes, I think. Um, and, you know, in terms of the visual that Claire was presenting with the dance, but then looking for that dynamic movement, one of the, um, definitions that I offered of reflection um, to my friend um, that I had the conversation with that if you've listened to the recording that I, I presented for the panel discussion was that when I think of um, reflection I think of how it feels to me when I look at a body of water that's still and what do I see in that body of water as a living experience because the water doesn't stay still for very long normally you know um, and so, you know, there'll be some sort of vibration, some sort of um, changing of the image. So when I see myself clearly in the water, I might experience that as beauty or I may not. Maybe I'll see it as more beautiful when the water ripples a little. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll see a deeper goodness or truth um, in that water when there's a slight ripple. And so, yeah, so I just wonder if we're talking more of reflection than symmetry. I think there's also this thing that when I see you seeing me seeing you, it gets this into this endless spiral that has its own sense of a, a, a larger, an immensity because it gets into the hall of mirrors kind of thing in relationship. But there's some more 
question. It, the question's coming up here. Well, I, I would just, so, hello, everybody. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm actually coming from one of the things I'm coming from is a, is a history of working in ballet. And ballet is traditionally built up very much, in fact, entirely on symmetries uh, and, and geometries. And, but I happen to work for William Forsyth, who spent 30 years deconstructing ballet and, and, and basically maybe imposing non-Euclidean geometry on ballet. So when I'm listening to symmetry and beauty and reflection, I, I kind of hear it in a way that, well, yes, I mean, that's kind of traditionally, these are categories and subjects that are of interest, but they don't have to be. Um, and, and in the small breakout group we had, um, you know, I was going back to Gregory Bateson, who, for example, documented Balinese um, dance rituals, where the whole point of the ritual is for it to break down and fall apart and to go into chaos. Uh, it's that is when the gods arrive, is when the entire thing goes into mayhem and, and the dancers start to stab themselves and the audience has to jump on top of people. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of other subjectivities and there's also non-Western aesthetic perception. And I actually feel like, you know, with climate change hitting us full frontal, a lot of what cybernetics gives me is a way to get out of these conventional patterns of, of classical symmetry of, of under, for example, of saying aesthetic and beauty comes from a disruption of self. I mean, it's, it's not in any way a reflection of oneself. It's when, when your, you know, when your, your mode of your, your conventional modality is disrupted. We talked about John Cage, saying if something is boring after 30 seconds, well then try, try five minutes. And if it's not you know, interesting after five minutes, then try an hour and eventually it will become interesting. That it will become beautiful. It will become something real. So I, I'm just saying there, there are different ways to look at these, you know, these, thing, these subject matters. And, and what I can say is that the, can, you know, the, the performing arts or the experimental arts have been exploring other modes of perception and beauty and self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Claudia made a comment that isn't it rather the experience of beauty arises from the quality of connecting with the world that seems to resonate with a number of the ideas we're talking about. Have you any thoughts on that? Um. I really, really hear what, sorry, I missed the, the, the person who's just spoken his name, but Steve, um, Steve. Yeah. yeah, I really hear what you're saying. And I, um, and I think that that requires a, um, a paying attention and a being allowing yourself to be open so that you can actually see what's emerging and get out of your, um, we all come from with those preconditions and it takes a level of, well, humility is a really huge part of that. And when we, um, it takes, you know, we're human. So we bring all that baggage with us. It takes a while to be able to see some of that, um, that beauty, which is uh, um, it, there. I think that there is some, something that starts, you start to see, um almost like a harmony or, or but i hate to use the word harmony because we think of that as beautiful as our, our western way of looking at that harmony but there's something authentic and something that's true that you start to see emerging but you have to allow yourself the time to um to sit with it until it starts to emerge i mean i, I would add the word neurotypical uh, instead of human uh, because, you know, not everybody does see the world this way. So neurotypical would yeah. be a good word. The chat has been very robust here. I think we're going to have to keep that. But Peter, could you try expressing what you just said a little moment ago to the group in the chat? Behold well, um, well, so um, I, I teach... Um, I've been teaching courses on the neuroscience of music and neuroaesthetics. 
um, and also neuroscience of consciousness. And um, I, I take the view that aesthetics is related to what we perceive as um, the good, the beautiful, the preferred. Um, it has to do with our, our own set of valuations, uh, what we think is important, what we're, what we're looking for. And I see art as a means that we can explore our own internal psychological states. Uh, in desirable ways, and that can be provocative or it can be um, relaxation or any number of about 20 different ways that we use art. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that beauty is in the, in the mind of the head, but there are also social relations and social histories and social meanings that are embedded in us because we're social beings, uh, and those uh, modulate our our feelings about what we consider to be beautiful. So um, I don't think that there's a tension between that, uh, but the locus of where those, where those relations are is in, the, is in the head, it's in the brain. Is that, is that what you were looking for? No, I wasn't looking for anything particular, just to bring it forth. I'd love, something I'd, love to, so, I'd love to throw something in you know, toward Peter and, and see if you uh, find it worth responding to. Um, a few years ago, I, I stumbled upon a, um, a Christopher Alexander's work and, you know, I've read most of his books now. And I, I find his uh, work um, in trying to find commonality uh, between human beings and their perception of beauty, beauty, um, Certainly interesting, if not more than that. Are you familiar with uh, Christopher Alexander's work, Peter? Uh, yes, and I like his work. Uh, I'm not. I don't know what his framework for aesthetics is. Well, ba basically, and I, we won't need to go down into this. If you, you know, if it had resonated, you could have made a comment. But basically, he did all this kind of research where he, he basically mostly with students, but um, found out that people always given two images, um, they would have 60 to 80% congruence on saying this image is more beautiful than that one. And there could be incredibly subtle differences between the two, but they still, so he was trying to make a point that there is something human, you know, culturally and, and biologically that, that uh, so aesthetics or beauty is aliveness. He used lots of different words in his research, trying to find a word that, or a set of words that pointed to what he was interested in. So but beauty and aliveness were the two that he used most often with the subjects. So, so there are universals, but there are also individual differences. Like, for example, animals tend to like sweet stuff. Most of us like sweet stuff. You know, most of us prefer sweet over bitter, let's say. So, um, um, it's they're, they're universals and they're particulars of you of culture at uh, each culture and there are also particularities of each individual right can well, I, can I, I just I, it wasn't greater it was never greater than 80 percent it was usually closer to 60 so you're, he would agree we evolve our perceptions of beauty pardon we evolve our perceptions of beauty by training by people lecturing us um Absolutely. whatever I, I, I find more things beautiful than I did when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something about um, um, symmetry and asymmetry? Uh, I came across um, this distinction between art and science, and I put it in the chat box. And uh, the, the idea is that um, some people can see similarity and differences, and some people can see differences and similarity, uh, and we might call the former people that are more scientifically oriented and, and we might call the, the latter people that are more artistic. Now, um, and I think that could be culture, that could be environmental, it could be to do with how you're trained. Um, I, just find, I just find it interesting and I wonder if we do have a leaning towards one or the other uh, or if we can train ourselves to, to think differently. So, um, and I suppose it's to do with how we notice things and how we categorize things and therefore how do we, are we more inclined towards to see similarity of differences and, and, and the rest is, you know, it follows. Uh, I wonder if that's um, a useful way to, to think about things in terms of aesthetics and beauty. Can I ask you something real quick? A few years ago, I tried to oversimplify my world and came to believe that 
this beauty uh, and art are about the particulars and science is about the general and that there is an interplay between them. And at least that allowed me to go on to other questions. Can I bring up something that, that, um, that does stand out for me? And I think from a very Western perspective, I think we do talk more about the individual. And one of the things that I was really fascinated by when I was looking at, I grew up in South Africa and noticing that, um, that art was the center of a society um, and it helped to inform who they were, gave a sense of identity. And in Western societies, it's kind of like a frill and on the edges. And, um, but there's something about it being held by a community and an aesthetic held by a community. And so I just, I actually think that there is a tension there that, um, that, that also needs discussing. I know as a community artist, the thing where the, the aesthetic is actually in that common shared recognition of value that um, that's kind of, it's in the actual process. It's not, it cannot be separated out. It's why I'm actually quite uncomfortable sometimes with art that, that is bought and sold because, you know, that's fine, but we've kind of sometimes reduced art to that or reduced it to a sort of commodification almost. And, um, and it's in the actual, it's not the art, it's actually the, it's what it embodies about the relationship and who's, you know, what's being seen there, so. Yeah, meaning is a relationship and the most powerful relationship is the relationship of belonging. Yeah. So the art becomes uh, a, a, a source of belonging, a source of meaning yeah. um, in, in uh, a very complex world. A logistic, like that, oh, sorry. Yeah, like one, this was one of the questions we raised in our group, is where, where do people have a sense of belonging? I think one of the characteristics of, of, of Western society is the alienation. The people don't feel they belong to the world. They don't feel they belong <coughs> anywhere. A totally logistics issue. We are over our time, but <laughs> for the last session of the day, we are allowed to keep going. So <laughs> the next session will be tomorrow. Yes. That's me. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that I, I keep having the uh, the image that is used so often these days, uh, which is the image of the iceberg. And, you know, we see the tip of the iceberg and the sunlight is shining on it and it's a white little beautiful snow cap. But underneath the iceberg is a gigantic, you know, kind of monstrous shape uh, you know, it, like a yeah, just some some kind of unusual, weird, giant shape underneath. And so, for example, that would be a painting. A painting is a messy, messy, totally random, dirty process that takes hours and hours and hours, and all these different gestures happen. And at the end, there's this painting, which is the tip of the iceberg, but. The fact is that the process of painting is radically nonlinear and just a big mess. There's a great book, I'm sure everybody knows this, but you know, uh, Andrew Pickering's book, The Mangle of Practice, where he says that in fact, scientific research is like that. Scientific research is radically hit and miss and messy. And it's only at the very end that you polish off the plate and the spoon and the fork and the knife and you put it on the table, but getting there is just a big mess. And the thing is that, again, I'm pushing, I'm coming from the perspective, I'm not really interested in how we are. I'm interested in how we need to get to be. Um, there's a concept of, in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy of the people to come. So it's like, what have we got to learn? And the thing is that we need to, you know, we need to learn how nature works, what's behind the things that we see that we don't take notice of, but we need to understand. And then also our natural time frame for, for making decisions is our own lifetime or is even shorter than that. And we're being asked to think in entirely different ways because if we don't, we'll actually destroy where we're, you know, our whole ecosystem. So really, I actually 
you know, have don't much have much time on my watch for how we are. Um, but I'm, and I'm interested in what cybernetics and the history of cybernetics can bring towards what we need to do and where we need to go. And I find that like an extremely rich terrain to mine from. I find that if we take some aspects of ourselves as we are, they provide the continuity for whom we want to be because there are possible, probably aspects that we like that we want to continue and that's the migration path. Absolutely. 50 years ago, there was a, uh, a cybernetic analysis of our environmental situation uh, in a book called Limits to Growth. And what we've done is for various reasons, we have adopted a belief in international capitalism and the global free market because they promise and in fact deliver a constantly growing and exponentially growing consumption. And we are literally consuming the planet. And, uh, and, and we have a cybernetic analysis of it. It's sitting right there. It's been there for 50 years and nobody talks about it. It's, 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 it's so, yeah. Anyway, it drives me crazy. It became impolite to speak about population growth about 20 years ago. Well, population, um, the, population uh, growth is, is probably going to peak in the next couple of years. Anyway, yeah. But you know, I think sometimes we get, I, absolutely, we need to get involved in this trying to solve problems. But I think we miss the, the nuances and the things that are right in front of us. And in missing those things that are right there, we're actually, when you blow that up into the sort of bigger structures and how we make decisions, when those nuances are missing, they're part of the whole, but we've excluded them. And we're continually doing that. Those, um, it, that magnifies into all of our systems. And uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, I, every time I sort of think we try and solve problems, but we miss that core piece, we're missing a lot. <laughs> yeah, I would say, if I understand Ashby correctly, if we leave out mothers and artists, no model will have a requisite variety. Uh, really, the world <laughs> is lived in neighborhoods, and if we can't uh, have the metasystemic structures above neighborhoods evolve from and with neighborhoods, we're doomed. Yeah. We are doomed. That's already a very wonderful pl game plan or kind of strategy, you know, I believe. That's, yeah. that's what we need they're, to do. Yeah, they're linked in the sort of way, as I was, was saying, that it's the immediate experience of nature that give us, gives us our sense of belonging to nature so that we can understand that there is the reality of which we are a part and which is a value and which we need to protect. And, and so it goes both ways. It both uh, uh, is the immediate experience that takes us into a much higher level of, uh, of concern. So yeah, like, like I, 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 I'm, I'm, one of the things is, is, is I notice about Claire is she is so tactile and I'm a tactile person and, and, and I spend my life living with visual people who are so visually oriented and I'm saying, you know, how does it feel, you know, how do you get a handle on that and uh, everybody else is saying, well, how can I get a bird's eye view of this and they've got this sort of distance, sort of, sort of quality. Anyway, so yeah, so I, 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 I think uh, getting into the feeling does in fact take us to a higher level of concern and help restore the meta meta. meta. I'd like to add to all of this that, you know, if we're thinking about the future, then perhaps we can take a view on a very personal level to say that, okay, let's take the example of experiencing nature. So if I see a flower and I appreciate that flower, so a quote was offered to me and it's, 
you know, it means that I've made dramatic changes in, in what I accept as gifts because the, what was said to me was that if I like this flower, I'll pick it. If I love this flower, I'll allow it to grow and become whatever it's meant to become, right? And we all know that this flower, because it's a natural thing, will go through its natural, you know, sort of experience of growth and then death and then rebirth. And so my suggestion is that, you know, when we're moving through life, if we continually hold on to the fact that we are natural beings and that, you know, all, what we're here to do is to live. And what does that mean to live? It means to grow. And so we create opportunities for ourselves to grow by being present in the moment, by being present in every experience that we're fortunate enough to participate in and to allow ourselves to evolve in that way. But that also means that there's a responsibility to others in the sense of that as I'm growing, I should be conscious of that growth. And the in, in that consciousness, what I'm doing is to really be the best version of me, you know, in that pursuit of growth, you know, to, to really sort of think about making choices that will have a a positive impact on myself, on others, and to continually choose to take actions that will have a positive impact on myself and others. And that's where I see the sort of future because in my work as a global education consultant or whatever I call myself, um, that's really sort of, you know, the continual conversation that I'm having with educators and with students and with administrators of schools that, you know, how do we create a culture where you really see learning as an experience and not as an end goal to move away from this idea that I've done my learning once I leave school and to embrace the idea that learning is a lifelong process and that, you know, every experience that we have in life is an opportunity to create meaning, to grow, to live, to really live as a living being. And that's really sort of where I see the future, to, to create environments and experiences for us as adults and as young people to be able to feel that freedom to grow. Kavita, can, can I? So, so I think I like your, <laughs> I like your description of a, of a flower. That's quite quite interesting. Um, but when we speak about the environment, um, the, 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 the regime, the structures that establish our environment, they dominate what each of us can and can't do. So we're in this nested hierarchy. Uh, um, and if we think about humanity, broadly speaking, you can say it was religious, religion, nation states, and now multinational corporations, which are the dominant institution logic that shape our lives. Uh, and, and for better or for worse, we're in that hierarchy of systems, as it were. So how does one find themselves in that system? How does one trade off? You know, it, it's, it's, I, I'd, I'd love to start somewhere else, but I'm in this reality where I have a mortgage and yeah. all that Surely. Stuff. How can How can we start the conversation where reality actually is or the constraints are? Doesn't the underlying accountancy or rather our hierarchies of value. And if we value uh, things about how much money we've got, rather than say how beautiful we are, or how well we can sing or produce poetry or influence um, a crowd, then the game is to get everybody involved in our game. And if we're good at poetry or rap, let's say, then we try and engage people in that if we're good at accumulating lots of tokens which enable you to call upon the work or the products of other people's work, aka money, uh, you'll probably try and engage people in that. And uh, perhaps we need to sort of share a wider variety of hierarchies of value and uh, convince other people that our particular hierarchies of value are as worthwhile as playing around in um, as theirs. I mean, I appreciate the um, call for us all to be better, more beautiful, 
convivial human beings. And that's fine if you're at least halfway up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and OK, fair enough, convivial interaction may help you to sort of uh, climb up there. But I have a friend who always interrupts to economics conversations by saying, well, love is fundamental, though, isn't it? He's fundamentally a very aggressive guy, but he's uh, absolutely right about his point. But it's not the um, whole picture. And, you know, religions have been exhorting us to try harder for a long time. Maybe art can do that better um, than religion. But I suppose discussions such as this and the normal human interaction where we try and argue that my teddy bear is more valued than your teddy bear or whatever sort of taps into this uh, how we evaluate art but how we also use art as a form of rhetoric and value um, gaining for possibly sociobiological purposes but maybe we, we transcend that. Yeah, completely orthogonal to what's going on. I just want to throw one piece out. I'm a slow thinker. Back to the to my comments about Christopher Alexander. Um, I think he he offers something really amazingly uh, powerful, and that is his his idea about non-destructive development, or I just call it non-cancerous development, where he essentially says that you can get a pretty uh, wonderful whole system if the rule in play most of the time is that whenever you're getting ready to change something, you make sure that the way you change it makes the, the forward facing and the backward facing system, the, the thing that contains it and the things that it contains all better. And with that simple rule, you can evolve really quite, um, quite beautiful systems. And, and I think that's more or less, more or less the way the body works and biology works. So, I, I just I, that's another piece I'd love to be having conversations about. How can we turn that um, heuristic, um, explore it? Is it correct? How to, how to implement it more widely? Because God knows people did not adopt uh, Alexander's approach to architecture. That's the essence of game theory, isn't it? That you try and go for the best outcome for you and the group, not just yourself or the or the other. Is, is isn't that so? Aren't we saying the same thing there? I, I think that's one, one aspect of it. Uh, I think this, yeah, game theory is a, yeah, that resonates with it. I mean, to me, game theory 101 is entirely selfish and more advanced game theory is altruism. Uh, if we can collaborate, uh, if we can cooperate, uh, if you don't know when the person will leave the game uh, and there's a long-term interaction. It pays off to be moral. If I'm only going to see you once, arguably, if I can get away with it, it pays uh, for me to mug you, or more likely for you to mug um, me. But uh, it's educating people that mm. sort of more subtle, longer-term payoffs, cooperative payoffs, like we yeah. are the products of cooperative genes. Uh, to call that... Difficult. To call that game theory 101, that puts it in an academic environment. Game theory 101, if we take it from mothers, <laughs> if that's the original game, somebody has a mm. child, <laughs> it's quite different than that. You're absolutely right. And I say that in my uh, video on the previous uh, year's UK Cybernetic Society website. We are all the products of a certain level of cooperation between two different sets of genes, neither of which can replicate themselves 100%. But hey, it protects us from viruses and other microbacteria. So I mean, arguably, we had to learn to cooperate in order to ethnically cleanse the planet from Homo habilis and the Neanderthals. I just think it's more about scale than genetics, frankly. Uh, people in close proximity uh, are more likely to cooperate than, than with strangers. Well, it five is five because... Five um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put in my last little word, uh, trying to create a dichotomy of game theory being one thing or another thing doesn't feel right either. It seems to me that we are always operating in a much richer set of possibilities. And that's where I think aesthetics is an opening to that wider set of possibilities that it's worth engaging with. 
multitudinously and simultaneously. Yeah. I, I, I came across this phrase um, uh, about games. Uh, Jordan Peterson said it, and I was at a, at a, sp at a sports day um, with my child. He's a seven-year-old boy, and the headmaster got up and said, we're teaching the kids about winning and losing. And that made me cringe a little bit because I didn't, you know, this is a private school which I pay for. And I thought, well, don't worry, he'll find out about winning and losing in good, good time. We, we need to have fun. And, and what um, Jordan Peterson says is the, the name of the game isn't to win or lose per se. It's just to find enough people around that are willing to play the game with you again. So it's about that longevity. And, and that really resonated with me. Uh, and, and maybe it's something that I've taken forward in, in my uh, parenting um, approach. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely one of his problems these days. Um, oh. <laughs> the first time I heard of Jordan Peterson, he was being denounced from the pulpit as the epitome of evil. So anyway. It, well, it, I'm highly annoyed to find uh, myself enjoying with Jordan Peterson, but nobody is useful enough to be wrong all of the time, so thank you, I don't. <laughs> Margarita's got her hand up. So, um, I raise my question since you bring up mothers and and also um cooperative uh thinking uh, so i'm not a cyber medician this is my first time and and i'm wondering how much uh, you have explored like object relations theory just the the work of ian sutty who, who uh the origins of love and hate uh, who, who, instead of saying you're either cooperative or we're uh, selfish, who, who kind of goes back to the very original interactions between mother and child. And it can be modeled as a system, like part of the family system. And that this says um, that these original interactions uh, either like push the child in or the infant into uh, just the defensive uh, thinking that's selfish. And the alternative is more the, the cooperative uh, or relational thinking. And so when I say object relations, I'm also talking about Bowlby and Winnicott and, and, um, and beyond. And so I'm just curious how much interaction there is between these two uh, branches of research, so to say. So is there any that. cybernetician who is actually working with object relations theory to enrich? Uh, because Ashby was a psychiatrist, so uh, a psychiatrist. So, so there is an opportunity for a connection. <laughs> there is. I mean, some of uh, object relationship theory, what I know of Anna Freud, is a little bit difficult to swallow. But that might be because of, um, I don't know, mental illnesses in my family early on. I sort of reject um, these notions. Uh, the whole Freudian psychiatric um, structure, it, it, it suffers from what all social sciences suffer from, which is that as we theorise about it, we change ourselves. We develop. We don't get the same uh, mental illnesses that Freud um, examined. Whether we're still getting what we probably are still getting what Anna Freud um, talked about, given the way that uh, we deliver our children. So may, may I make a plug then to 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 study Ian Sutty, uh, given that his work is actually a very explicit criticism of Freud that he kind of zooms in on all the things that he thinks that Freud is um, misdirecting us. So, um, and I think he's being rediscovered as we speak. Um, and, and also the other reason I bring him up because it connects with the concept of uh, just again family systems, that there is a rite of passage of the, the child to the adult and, and that that plays also a role into how selfish the adult behavior will be as opposed to being more cooperative. Um, there's again uh, the influence of the family system. And I think there is a cybernetic, um, a, a, a group of cyberneticians that look at that because that's like Gates and the Margaret Mead's uh, work. 
I'm going to have to say that our Zoom session is about to close by the organizers, so we will have to say goodbye. And thank you, everybody, for you. your incredibly interesting comments and contributions. It's uh, been a really great session. Thank you. Thank you.